Father, I thank you that we can come to your word on this very special day, Lord, as we remember, as we remember what you did, as we remember the days before you arrived in Jerusalem in that la those final days. So, Father, I pray that you open your word to us. Give us understanding. Give us revelation. Help us to relate what we're going to look at into our own lives today. Help us, Father, to come into a deeper relationship with you. So, Lord, we commit this time to you and pray most of all that you are glorified. And above all things, the name of Jesus Christ is lifted up in this place. Amen. Amen. So, I'm entitling this, The Last Days the last few days before Christ was crucified. The preparation of what happened, what went into those last few days. Uh, we will end it obviously before, we'll end today's message before Jesus actually arrives in Jerusalem and before the crucifixion, which we will look at on Friday night. So I hope you're all here and bring friends and relatives and family here for that. But we need to look at the last days. Some interesting things happened in the very last few days, the very last like six days before Christ was crucified. Everybody always focuses on the crucifixion, which is of course what we should focus on because that's where Christ did the work that means that you and I are not going to go to hell assuming that we know Jesus Christ as our personal savior, but in fact that we can spend eternity with an almighty everlasting God. Yeah. Can anybody say hallelujah? All right, but some interesting things happened to two men on the, in those last days that had no intention of meeting Jesus, and yet they did, and their lives were changed. So we're going to look, remember last week we talked about Jericho, so we're, st we're still in Jericho. So today, we're going to look at, as Jesus came into the city of Jericho, Jericho, uh, we're going to call this uh, the last days. Jesus entered Jericho. He entered on one side of town, and he left on the other side of town. That makes perfect sense, right? Because he's on the road headed toward Jerusalem, which is 18 miles away, and he's walking. Now, we understand that we have trouble if our Dahar doesn't have air conditioning in the summertime driving five miles, right? He's walking. And I want to tell you something, it's very warm in Jerusalem at this time. But he's walking with his entourage and, and the disciples that are following him. He's walking. Jericho was also known as the City of Roses. Isn't that a wonderful name? The City of Roses. Now, I did some research and wasn't able to find out where that came from, but we'll leave it at that. So he entered Jericho with his entourage and it was crowded because it is just before the Passover the priests and the families are are all packing up in there some of them are already heading out to walk that 18 miles to Jerusalem to be in Jerusalem for the Passover because that was the greatest thing that any Jewish person could do or family was to be in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover and so the city was crowded so don't think of a little country village uh, like some of us have been in. But in fact, think of a city, not a huge big city, but a city that's very congested. You know, there weren't four lanes going through the town of Jericho. There was one road going through the town of Jericho. Everybody's on that road. There's donkeys on the road. There's, there's wagons on the road. There's families on the road. And they're all headed one direction. Except for those, of course, who are along the side of the road trying to, trying to work their business, whatever it happened to be and included those uh, was a man, a blind man, which is where all the, the blind people or those who needed help, the beggars sat on the side of the road, holding their cups or their baskets or whatever, begging for help, begging for food, begging for money. But there was one man there who was totally blind. The Bible doesn't tell us if he'd been blind since birth, but he was totally blind, and he too begged in that group of beggars. Now, for this man whose name was Bartimaeus, this day started like any other day. Just like you and I could say, this day started like any other day, any Monday or Tuesday, it started like any other day. We didn't expect that anything miraculous, well, anything exciting, much less miraculous, would possibly happen on this particular day. How many of us have gotten up and thought it's just another day? And then something happens that day that makes it different than any day before. 
It may be the day we meet the Lord. It may be the day that God touched us and we received our healing. It may be the day that we spoke to somebody and we shared with them about Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed for us. We shared with them about what happened on the cross and we saw that person come to the Lord. So, but he, just like any other day, he got up and yes, I do use a little sanctified imagination, which means it's okay. <laughs> and that, that says, I, I just think about this beggar because I don't know if he had a house or a hut or a, I don't know what he stayed in at night, but beggars we normally think about when we are in big cities or towns or in other countries like some of us have been. Beggars are really dirty because they don't have a way unless there's a river or something to wash in and then usually there's a fragrance about them. We'll leave it, <laughs> stench, we'll leave it at that. Uh, that, uh, that, that we are very familiar with. And their clothes are normally dirty. So, so as we picture Jesus and his entourage and the crowd of people, we picture this group of beggars along the side of the road and which our friend, Bartimaeus, the blind man, was sitting. He, was, uh, he must have he awakened wherever he slept. He must have shook his, his coat, his coverings off, and... Uh, and he began tapping his way along the familiar route, that however he got to the place that he always begged. Because when beggars beg in a certain place for a long period of time, they kind of own that corner. And nobody else should push them out of that corner or that spot along with the rest of the beggars. So he must have tapped his way along on this ordinary day to where he normally begged. But this day was different because it was so crowded. There were so many voices, so many things were happening. And as he settled himself down with the rest of the beggars, the word was out about Jesus. He heard people talking because they, the word was out that Jesus was coming. Because, you know, kids and people run ahead and they say, Jesus is coming. Remember the man that did all the healings, the man that, 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 uh, uh, the dead man was, he brought a dead man back to life. Remember that man? He's coming. He's coming. He's just coming through the gate now at Jericho. He's coming right in here. He's going to be here. So all the people were talking about this, and he had to have heard it. So everyone was talking, and the blind man heard, and he'd heard all the amazing things that Jesus had done on this perfectly ordinary day. Jesus was about to pass by him. What would you do if you were in downtown Walker, and you were on the street, and you didn't have to be begging, but you were out on the street just doing your daily thing, and, and then you heard that Jesus was coming by. Well, you'd probably kind of question that. But still, what would you do if you just put yourself in that man's position? So I'm going to read the scripture in chapter Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 35. Chapter 18, starting with verse 35. And it came about that as he was approaching Jericho, a certain blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a multitude going by, he began to inquire, what is happening? What is happening? And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now there's a crowd of people and everybody's talking. And so he had to yell in order to get over the top of all those voices. The most amazing thing, the Bible says, and Jesus stopped. Jesus knew where he was going. Jesus had a purpose. Jesus was headed for Jerusalem, and he knew what was going to happen there. But with all of that on his mind, still he heard that beggar cry out. Because what happened to that beggar? Suddenly, somewhere inside him, he knew, he just knew that he had to have a touch from Jesus. That he just had to be touched by Jesus. It was his only hope, maybe. He didn't even know probably what would happen, but Jesus, have mercy on me. I, and so, if you imagine the emotion that was inside that man as he cried out to Jesus, have mercy on me. And the amazing thing is, that Jesus heard him above all the voices. And Jesus does the same thing for you and I. When all everything is going on, when we get into that position where we're just desperate enough to say, Jesus, I need your help. 
Jesus, help me. I don't know how I got in this mess. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this mess. I don't know how this is all going to be resolved, but I need your help. And I would pray that each one of us, when we get to that place, that's what we do. We cry out. We don't try to walk through it like strong people. You know, I can do this. There is nothing too difficult for me. No, that's a twist of scripture. There's nothing too difficult for him. But he, he wants our attention. And he will do it if we'll simply say, help me. What does that mean? It means we have to let go of our pride, our arrogance, our stubbornness. Now, I know that nobody here is stubborn. I, I recognize that. So we're talking about that other church down the road. <laughs> Those stubborn people. But you and I need to let go of all of that to say, I need you. Sometimes it's just a matter of we're just not, there's something missing in my life. There's something just not right. There's something I just can't seem to, to grasp whatever it is that God wants me to do. I just can't seem to get hold of that. Maybe it's that simple. I just can't seem to understand what he's trying to say to me. Maybe it's that simple. That's when we go out and we fall on our face before the Lord and we say, help me. Help me, Lord. Help me to understand. You know, when I was first, first trying to read the Bible, and I do say that, trying to read the Bible, I found it pretty dead. This is about 30 years ago. I thought, this is the, the deadest book I've ever read. I mean, I don't know why people say this book is alive because it's not alive to me. But so I started praying. Nobody taught me this. I know now the Holy Spirit showed me this. When I opened the Bible on the morning in the morning when I was going to read, I would say, God, bring this book alive to me. It's not alive to me. Bring it alive to me. And then I would read whatever I was going to read. And then when I got done reading that, I would say, I would thank him for bringing it alive. Nobody taught me that except the Holy Spirit. I wasn't in a church at the time. And something happened. Something wonderful happened. About halfway, oh, probably about four months had passed, and one day I realized I wasn't reading the Bible for just 10 minutes in the morning or 15 minutes or even a half an hour or even an hour. I was reading for three, four, five hours in the morning. I, I, it was the most exciting book I've ever read. It came alive. When did it come alive? Because I told God, I don't understand it. Bring it alive to me. And he did. Because he's faithful. He wants to teach us. He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. He doesn't always want us to stay babies who don't know how to walk. He wants us to learn how to walk, and then how, well, first to stand up, and then how to walk, and then how to run with him, and then last of all to fly. I love flying with the Lord. It's the most exciting thing, and he'll never drop you either, I must say. So, he said, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he had come near, he questioned him. He said, What do you want me to do for you? And that's what the Lord says to us. What do you want him to do for you? What is it in your life? What is it in my life that I want him to do for me? To help me. What is it? What is it in your life that you need Jesus to do? Now, Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. Now, when he was brought to him, I think that the beggars and the people that were around him tried to stop him, to say, just be quiet, sit down, sit down, be quiet. He's, he doesn't want to hear from you, will you be quiet? How many in our own family, when we come to the Lord Jesus, say, will you just be quiet? I don't want to hear about this Jesus thing anymore. Will you just be quiet? Just shut your mouth. So they must have tried to stop him. He just stop. But then when Jesus stopped and said, bring him to me, oh, well then, okay, well, come on. Oh, he wants to see you. And so they probably helped him go forward. They'd have to help him. He had everybody all around him. So he'd have to have a little guidance to help him get to in front of Jesus. And now he's in front of Jesus. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. So obviously he had not been blind all of his life. Imagine someone who has not been blind part of their life and then they lose their eyesight completely, what that must be like. I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, 
receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Verse 43, and immediately he regained his sight. Wow. I mean, it doesn't say in the next week or a week later or tomorrow or five hours later. It says immediately he regained his sight. Now think about this. He's standing right in front of Jesus. He's standing right in front of him. I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said, you have re your faith has made you well. His eyes are opened and immediately he sees. Who does he see? He sees Jesus. He's looking into the face of Jesus. What must that be like? What would that have been like to be there, to be him, to be Bartimaeus? He sees the most beautiful thing he's ever seen in his entire life, the face of Jesus Christ. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying. You and I, they, you know there are people that are blind. Their eyes are blind. Physically they can't see. But there are also people who's, who are blind in their spirit, blind in their soul, and they cannot see this thing called the kingdom of God. And how sad that is. There's all kinds of blindness. I believe the blindness that Bartimaeus had, the physical blindness, would be much superior to the darkness of not knowing Jesus Christ. Because when we don't know Jesus Christ, we have no hope. We have no hope of anything ever getting better. Not really. We may have an impractical kind of hope. I hope that if I just keep walking the way I'm walking, it'll all get better somehow. You know, keep doing the things you've always done the way you've always done them, and they will remain just exactly as they always were. Right? And so sometimes we need to make a change. We need to say, okay, I have to, I have to stand up here and I have to tell Jesus what it is I need. Right. And he's faithful to give us what we need. What we need, not what we want. Sorry. Turn to someone and say, it's not what you want. It's what you need. <laughs> Let me see Jesus. And so the first thing he looked at is Jesus in Jesus' face. And then immediately when he had the light and he had understanding, he followed Jesus. And that's what you and I do as we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Once we have that revelation, then we are to follow him. And he says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Become means there's a process. I mean, we don't just today come to Jesus Christ and immediately pastor a church or whatever or start a ministry. It's, it's an understanding that there is a process. I will make you become fishers of men. How many want to become fishers of men? Oh, it's an awesome thing. So now we have the blind man who is now no longer blind. He's had spiritual insight, spiritual revelation, spiritual light has come to him. And now Jesus is on his way, the rest of the way through Jericho, going out the other side, headed for Jerusalem. And there's another man as he's on his way out. He's a le if I were Irish, I'd say, oh, sure, and he's a wee little man. <laughs> His name is Zacchaeus. His name is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. So the Bible says, and he entered and was passing through Jericho, and behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Of course, he was a thief. He bribed. He stole. Uh, but he was a tax collector, and that was the reputation of tax collectors in that day. In Zacchaeus chapter 19, Jesus, this is Jesus' last personal encounter before his arrival in Jerusalem and the events leading to his death. So why is this important? Why are these two encounters important? We have a blind man who couldn't see, spiritually or physically, and then he meets Zacchaeus. And in the final line of, of Zacchaeus' story, it contains the summary of the entire purpose of Jesus' entire ministry. Verse 10, 1910. For the Son of Man, read it with me if it's up there. That's his entire purpose. He found me. Who else? 
Who else? He found me. He found Peter. He found Mike. He found Doug. I mean, the most amazing thing is that he found us because we were lost, and yet what we see both in, uh, excuse me, I'm still fighting this cold. What we see in both of these stories is that it almost appears that the individual, like Bartimaeus, is the first one that stood up and said, help me. But you see, the Holy Spirit comes within us first, not to reside within us, but comes and draws us to the Father, draws us to God, draws us to Jesus. So we can say, I've been looking and looking all over for God, and I, and that's because God's calling us, and sometimes we get into the wrong areas. Sometimes we get into the new age. Sometimes we get into cults. Sometimes because we're searching. So when I find someone who's been involved in the new age, I say, well, glory to God. Come and let's talk. Because what I know is they're searching for God in just the wrong place. And what does the enemy want? The enemy has many, many false religions and false ways to lead us. So if you're, someone's called of God and they go the wrong way, and the enemy laughs. That's exactly what he wants. But we need to help them see the right way. The only way, the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. And so, now he was, as I said, he was a wee little man. So when the Bible says he was a little man, he must have been a little man. I mean, really. He had to have been really short. So um, in this respect, the salvation of Zacchaeus has telling spiritual connections to the two events that preceded it. So, so Zacchaeus is trying to see who Jesus was in verse 3, and he was unable to because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran ahead because he did have legs. <laughs> he ran ahead and he climbed up in a sycamore tree. Well, that's smart, you know. He climbed up in a sycamore tree where he could get over the heads of all the people and he could observe from the sycamore tree, he could just see Jesus when he went by. All he wanted to do was see Jesus. He wasn't looking for anything. We don't know about anything. He just wanted to see Jesus. So he just thought if he went up in the sycamore tree, he could see over all these people, and, and he'd be safe up there, and he could just see. Now, the sycamore tree, if you're not familiar with it, has, is, a, is a wonderful tree, and it has big branches that, that go out, spread out, so you can kind of go out on the limb of a sycamore tree, and it's very easy to climb for a short person. So... As Jesus passed through Jericho, this man, Zer Zacharias, very short, chief tax collector, and he was very rich because he got rich by stealing, by thievery, by cheating. He was what we might call a sinner. Can we agree on that? <gasps> yes, we use that word right here in this church, <laughs> a sinner. From a tax collecting perspective, Zacchaeus had it made. I mean, he was. There were three major areas in which taxes were collected in Palestine. Capernaum, some of us got to be there, Jericho, and Jerusalem. Those are the three major places, and he had one of the big three. So he was doing pretty well. Jericho was very rich due to the palm forests and the balsam groves. And as, the, I'll, I'll say it like this, as a chief tax collector, Zacchaeus was head of a tax farming cartel with collectors who extorted the people, then paid him before they paid the Romans. So he was a kingpin of Jericho in the tax cartel, and he had the scruples of a modern-day crack dealer. Are you with me? Yeah. He's going to get in the kingdom? Are you kidding me? There's not a prayer. I mean, look at this. This, this, this man could not possibly get into the kingdom. Have we ever judged anybody like that? said, I'm not even going to share the gospel with him. Well, I know, Pastor Don. I'm not even going to share the gospel with him or her because there's just no way. I'm not even going near. The smell is too strong. And yet, who would think? This man. Everybody hated him. He was the most hated man in Jer He had to be. The Bible doesn't tell us that. I'm telling you. He had to be because of who he was and what he did. They hated him. They all knew they were being stolen from. They all knew he was cheating. And besides that, he was short. So, of course he was hated. He wasn't a likely candidate for the kingdom of God. In the eyes of his countrymen, his littleness was more than physical. He was a despised nobody. He was about to have an encounter with the living Lord. 
No one would ever have guessed on that spring day that Zacchaeus would want to see Jesus. So in verse uh, 3, we see that he was trying to see who he was, but he was small, so he ran ahead and he climbed the sycamore tree. Uh, maybe he knew Levi, the tax collector. Maybe he had known who we named Matthew. Maybe he had known him before, and he'd heard about Levi's conversion. So maybe a part of that was why he was here. It's, uh, it's most likely that the, with his wealth and his lifestyle, he was beginning to find that not so satisfying. You know, how would you like to live in a city where everybody hates you? That would not be very comforting, would it? You know, we're supposed to encourage people and we're supposed to exhort them and we're supposed to edify them and lift their spirits. He was in a city that everybody hated him. So I'm going to think that the Bible, he didn't have any friends except other tax collectors. Isn't that the way it usually is? So he found out that all that money that he was getting, all those riches, all that wealth he had was really fairly unsatisfying. And he needed something different because nothing lasts. Can we say that together? Nothing lasts. Now that's a pretty heavy thought if you think about it. Having just had my sister have the aneurysm, she could be gone today, but she isn't. But things change. I could have died in Kenya. Nothing lasts. But I couldn't die in Kenya because I couldn't imagine myself not being here. I mean, think about it. Can you imagine yourself not being here? I don't mean here in church on Sunday. I just mean here, yeah. present. It's hard because we, we're going to live forever, right? Nothing. Hello. <laughs> right? Nothing ever is going to impede my physical life here on earth. Right? So we're just going to be here forever. But in fact, what we see is that's not the way it works. Not the way it works at all. I have a friend who is an author. She writes, uh, uh, she has written many books. And one of them, then she was diagnosed with cancer. And after her diagnosis and after treatment and what she, they had told her that she probably had maybe five or six years to live, maybe. But she wrote a book after that saying, it was titled, Either Way, I win. Now, is that a positive thought? Either way, I win. I'm either healed of cancer or I, spend, I go home to spend eternity with the Lord. I like that kind of attitude. So maybe he knew Matthew. So it says he was unable to see Jesus because of the crowd, for he was small in stature, so he ran ahead, climbed up in the sycamore tree, and he's up there, he thinks nobody's going to pay any attention to him because they don't like him anyway, so surely nobody's going to say, Hi, how are you up there? They probably don't even look. So, But what was about to happen? Jesus was about to pass by. Pretty powerful. But he didn't know it yet. So, Verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, now remember, it's crowded. Remember, everybody's there. Everybody's so crowded, all the disciples, all the people, all the people heading for Jerusalem, it's crowded. People are talking and making a lot of noise. And Jesus gets underneath the sycamore tree, and, he's, and what does he say? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, what do you think Zacchaeus thought? Huh. <laughs> he saw me. Now, what about all the people? What about all the people that were around? <laughs> Why? Yeah, right. Everybody's going to go, you're, you're going you're gonna to stay at his house? Do you know who that is? He's the worst sinner we have. He's a thief. He's a liar. He's a cheat. But Jesus said, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Now, sometimes you read these scriptures, you read them so fast, he doesn't say, and Zacchaeus, by the way, would you mind if I came over to your house today? He said, today I must stay at your house. What does that tell us? What? That's right, so, that's right, don't pass me by. So he says, today I must, I must come to your house. I must be there. 
Now, what is it when Jesus is walking by and he's up in the sycamore tree and Jesus and all these people going around him, he's not, the Bible doesn't say he looks up to, the, to see Zacchaeus. And how, by the way, how does he know his name? Help me, God. <laughs> you want to come and preach? Okay. <laughs> he had a revelation from God about something that was happening immediately. And you and I have revelations. If we, if we know the Lord is our Savior, we have the Holy Spirit. He gives us revelations also. And so when I teach on how to hear the voice of God, this is one of them. In your spirit, he says to you, don't go there or go there or whatever, he tells you. Um, so, so Jesus is underneath the sycamore tree and he looks up and calls him by name. How many of you have ever heard the Lord call your name? Sometimes what I hear happens often and it happened with me is I hear my name, I heard my name before I, before I started to follow Jesus. I heard my name in the middle of the night. I woke up thinking somebody called my name but there was nobody there. And then a few months later I woke up again hearing my name like somebody's in the room, Dawn, woke up, nobody's there. I know other people that that's happened to, always in the middle of the night, before they ever came to know Jesus Christ. He's calling, he's calling us, each one of us. He knows us by name. And so is Zacchaeus. He calls Zacchaeus and he says, I must stay at your house. What does that tell me? That uh, Zacchaeus was a work of sovereign grace. God led him. Jesus came. He met him. And we know he came to know the Lord, which we'll look at. Jesus regarded this encounter with all the chaos in that divine mission. And he said, I would like to see and say, I'd like to stay at your house. He said, I must stay. So Zacchaeus regarded his encounter with the Christ as a divine mission. His seeking Zacchaeus was a sovereign work of God. His seeking of each one of us, we may not have looked at it this way, but it's a sovereign work of God. It's not just accidental. It's not just coincidental. It's, you've heard people say, that day that I met you, it impacted my life in some way, shape, or form. That day, there's a day you can look back and say, that person I met who talked to me about Jesus or that person I met who needed to, me to pray for them that day, everybody can look back at some incident at some time in your life and say, that day, that happening was divinely orchestrated by God. Yeah. Right? He, he, he has more than just a little passing interest in our lives. He's a part of every part of our life. And when I met Emmanuel in Africa, and by the way, Emmanuel is going to be here preaching in May. Finally, we're bringing him here. So when I met Emmanuel in Kenya, it was divinely orchestrated by God. And we've been together ever since, ministering, and this is the first time I've been able to bring him here. So the meeting, that meeting, I believe, was ordained from the foundation of the world. That was pretty weak. So I, some of you are going, really, how do you get that? Well, we're not in a study of the whole Bible today, just a piece. So uh, let, me, let me help you with that. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, starting with verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Whose will? God's will. God's will. Praise the Lord. So, back to Luke, verse 8. Chapter 19, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, 
Half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. I want this guy in our church. <laughs> I mean, he got it. He had a revelation. It, it, it's, it's really quite amazing, so let me, I, I had to break it out. For starters, Zacchaeus gave 50% of everything he had to the poor. Okay, he's been stealing it, granted, it wasn't all his, but he's his as far as he's concerned. So starting, he gave 50% of everything he had to the poor. This went far beyond the normal requirement of 20% of everyone's income. People say to me, well, they didn't have tithing in the Old Testament. Yes, they did. And a requirement to help the poor was 20% of your income, just to help the poor. So, and then... From the remaining 50%, he pledged to make restitution to the tune of four times the amount of what he had extorted. Now, he had cheated many people, and now he placed his entire fortune in jeopardy to make things right. I'd say he had a revelation <laughs> because it was divinely orchestrated by God in the first place. And when God divinely orchestrates something, he's going to get a revelation. Sometimes the revelation is, who I am and who Christ is, or who you are and who Christ is. Sometimes that first revelation of who we truly are, if we want to be honest, the revelation God gives us is a little disturbing sometimes. Sometimes if I want to ask a question of the Lord, I might say, God, can you, would you just show me how you see me? I think. I think I'm strong enough. And God is faithful because he'll show you your shortcomings. He'll show you where you're not as cool as you think you are. And, you're, oh, by the way, you're not as mature as you think you are. I'm speaking that to all of us. So when we get the courage sometime to ask God, show me how you see me or show me how you see my heart. Sometimes when people are coming into my office, now I'll scare everybody. I won't have an appointment for a month now. <laughs> um, somebody comes into my office and if, and, and I'll pray beforehand. You know before you come to my office with an appointment, I'm praying for you before you get there. And I'll ask God, show me this person's heart like you see it. Not like I think it is. Not, not, not that way that I think it is. But God, how do you see it? And I have a lot more, if I have a lot of compassion for you when you come into my office, you'll know God revealed a lot to me. <laughs> and you'll also know he took me off my pedestal and he showed me that you were crushed, that you were tired, that your heart was breaking. Sometimes he shows me hearts that are bleeding from wounds that I hadn't seen because all I saw was the prickly exterior. Oh, some of you do have prickly exteriors. There's a book out, I recommend it. It's called Dancing, The Prickly Art of Dancing with Porcupines. So do you understand my heart here? When we ask God, he's faithful to show us. So he said, um, the little man invited him to his house. And when you go and have a meal in Israel in someone's house, you always spend the night. You don't just go for a meal and then leave. You spend the night. So Jesus and the disciples would have spent the night in that sinner's house. Amazing. That's my God. He's an awesome God, and he loves each one of us no matter where we are in our walk. And we need to remember that, too. And he said, uh, the little man became a big one. So he walked through the doors of his house, a little man. But when he came back out the next time, he was a big man in so many ways. Um, acceptance by God had given the tax collector what he'd vainly sought through the accumulation of wealth. He got wholeness and satisfaction and most of all, peace. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ. In verse 9, Jesus said, Today, salvation has come to this house because he, too, is a son of Abraham. Today, salvation has come to his house. Did you know, there's something here, did you notice as a church people, and I hate that word because we're really, remember, we're really a fellowship of believers. But we want to bring them in and then, but, but we maybe should clean them up before we bring them in. But what does Jesus do? He brings them in and then he cleans them up. 
So when, so when he brings us into the Lord, he brings us into the body of Christ, he brings us into fellow believers, and then he does the cleanup job. We don't have to. All, what are we supposed to do? Love. 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 Christ working through us in love. And so he came out of there a big man. Stro he had strong emotion, deep, sweet feelings, confidence in forgiveness. Jesus said over and over that it's useless I in different scriptures, and I'm not going to go to them. Jesus said over and over that it's useless to talk about loving him and trusting him and having the sweet assurance of forgiveness and the glorious hope of heaven unless it makes a difference in our material attachments. Shall I repeat that? Jesus repeats over and over that it's useless to talk about loving him and trusting him and having the sweet assurance of forgiveness and the glorious hope of heaven unless it makes a difference in our material attachments. Amen? And I'm not talking about this like teaching on tithing or anything. I'm just saying this is, this is what the Lord says. We can talk all we want to about how mature we are in our walk with the Lord and how long we've been Christians and how many times we've read the Bible. We can talk all we want to, but if it doesn't carry itself through in what the Lord says that we are to do, I guess it doesn't count that much. Are you with me? Okay, so uh, Jesus' repeated emphasis is that Though generosity is not the means of redemption, it is the what? The evidence of redemption. In fact, generosity and giving are pillars of discipleship. And so we here in this church encourage everybody to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Not just a follower. Let me explain the difference between follower and disciple. Follower is part of that crowd that's following around Jesus. They're part of the crowd, but they're not the disciples. The disciples are those that really want to disciple under Jesus Christ and learn what is he saying? What does he mean? How do I walk like him? How, what do, how can I learn? What does the Bible say? A follower is someone who shows up in church on Sundays, um, comes to the church picnic, um, just various things, but never wants to really learn and grow. I want to be a disciple Amen. because as a disciple, I am going to grow. But as a follower, I'll grow some, I'll grow some until I learn what the difference is, until that hunger begins to grow in me to learn, to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, to grow in the Holy Spirit. So, the account of Zacchaeus is a changed life. And the great summary of Christ's mission, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. For what others could see, the cause was beyond salvation. If you'd lived in Jericho, you would have written him off. If you'd lived there, you'd have written him off too. He turned his back on God's word, his covenant people. Zacchaeus was a traitor. He made his money off the backs of his own people. He loved, mo he loved money. That's a problem, to love money. Salvation came to Zacchaeus because he was sought out. It was God who prompted the interior seeking. So it's God that makes us hungry. He causes us to search. He compels us to come. He compels us to come. You know how Zacchaeus was caught by the Lord? He was caught because in his seeking, he was sought. He was caught because in his seeking, he was sought. So, in closing, is God seeking you? Is God calling you to go deeper? Is, call, is God calling you to come? Just to come to the cross to say, I understand now who you are. Or is he calling you to come into that deeper relationship with him? to come into that deeper relationship, to come as a disciple and not just a follower. You know, has you, have you reached a time where nothing really fulfills anymore? Nothing really 100% satisfies? There's something missing. 
I see that all the time and hear it all the time from people before they come to the Lord. There was just something missing. Just something wasn't quite right. That wholeness, a clear conscience, peace, peace, the peace that we all need. But understand this, Christ is seeking each one of us in different ways. Many of us have come to the Lord. Many of us have turned our lives over to the Lord. Many of us have said, yes, Lord, whatever you want me to do, and oh, by that word, whatever, that's a really tricky word. Be careful when you pray that one. Whatever you want, Lord. I asked four times, what was it that you wanted? So I could be sure. Whatever, Lord. So Jesus passed by. He entered Jerusalem, and he was passing by a blind beggar. On his way out of Jerusalem, he was passing by Zacchaeus. And both men came to the Lord. One because he had an instant revelation that he needed Jesus Christ. One because he was just up in a tree trying to see who the heck he was. And God called him. And so I would say, I would suggest to each one of us, Jesus is passing by right now. Passing by each one of us, one way or the other. What do we want of him? Even now, what will you do? Let's pray. We're on our way to Jerusalem on Friday night as we look at the crucifixion. As we look at Jesus' purpose, even when he went through Jericho, he had time for the blind beggar. He had time for Zacchaeus. He had time for those things that God wanted him to do. We often feel we're so busy. We've got so much going on. I don't have time. Well, become a disciple and not a follower. That's my encouragement to you today. So let's just pray. What will you do? Jesus is calling you into a deeper place. What will you do? Will you say yes to the Lord? Or will you stand silent? Will you look right into his face and into his eyes and still stay silent? How can we? How can we? Father, I thank you for each person here, Lord. I thank you that we come to your word as Jesus is preparing to go into Jerusalem. And now, Lord, with his last encounter that he had with Zacchaeus, the last personal encounter before the crucifixion, Father, give us revelation, each one of us, an understanding of who we are in you and who you desire to be in us. So, Lord, let this week, as we prepare for Friday, let, it, let us this week come into a deeper revelation, more understanding, Father. Lord, we need you in so many ways. So, Father, I pray for each person here. Now, as you just stay with your eyes closed, if anyone here has never asked the Lord Jesus Christ, to come in and be a part of your life. Just raise your hand carefully right where you are now, and I'll just pray for you. I won't call you forward, and we can move forward. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, I pray for each of these people that as they leave, you protect them and you keep them, and you continue to draw them to yourself. So, Father, we ask your blessing on each one here of health and peace, and give them perseverance and vision, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.